morning. On behalf of Ecopatrol, I welcome you all to our investor day. In this opportunity, our management team would like to share with you an update of the company's business plan for 2022. My name is Lina Contreras. I'm Ecopatrol's IRO, and it's my pleasure to open this event here at the Plaza Hotel. Let me introduce our host for this morning presentation. Felipe Bayon, Chief Executive Officer. Jaime Caballero, Chief Financial Officer. Monica Jimenez, Secretary General. Juan Manuel Rojas, Strategy and Business Development Vice President. Jorge Calvache, Exploration Vice President. Rodrigo D'Alefiori, Development Vice President. Juan, Carlo, Juan Pablo Crane, Head of Capital Markets. Please pay attention to the following security recommendations. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, welcome to the Plaza Hotel. My name is O.G. Ubeva. I'm with the um, security department. Just a quick note before we um, start the event. A case of emergency, the primary means of egress would be through that door. Upon exiting the door, we have staircase P on your left and Q on your right. And both staircases will put you on 58th Street. Thank you. Enjoy the conference. Thank you. Before we start, we would like to share with you our, corpor our corporate video, which, which summarizes what we are doing in Ecopatrol and what we are looking forward on the years to come. Welcome to Ecopetrol. We are an integrated oil and gas company, the largest in Colombia and the country's biggest hydrocarbon producer. We are among the 40 largest oil companies in the world and the four largest in Latin America. We have an average production of 725,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day, which we extract from our production fields located mainly in Colombia, as well as in the U.S. Gulf of Mexico and Peru. We own the total refining capacity of Colombia through the Barranca Bermeja and Cartagena refineries, where we transform crude oil into higher value refined products. The Cartagena refinery is considered the most modern in Latin America. Committed to clean energy, we are engaged in producing biofuels such as ethanol and biodiesel through our companies, Bioenergy and Ecodiesel. In our continued path towards energy transition, we have a solar park in the department of Meta that will provide power to the Castilla field, the second largest in the country. During 2020, Senit, one of our affiliate companies, will build another solar park in Meta. In this manner, Ecopetrol's installed capacity of photovoltaic power will exceed 70 megawatts in less than two years. We are committed to reducing our CO2 emissions by 20% and reducing our routing clearings to zero by 2030. We have a network of close to 8,000 kilometers of oil and product pipelines connecting our production systems to major consumer centers and maritime terminals, from where we export to a number of destinations around the world. We have developed a solid geological knowledge of the country's basins and have long-term business relationships with some of the world's largest and most important energy companies. We own the country's main oil industry research center, the Colombian Oil Institute, located in the department of Santander. Every day, we strive to be a profitable and sustainable company to build mutually beneficial relationships with our stakeholders and continue with our commitment to operating in a clean and safe manner, thus ensuring operational excellence and transparency in our actions. Our strategy is based on three fundamental pillars, reserves and production growth, cash protection and cost efficiency, and strict capital discipline. These pillars will strengthen the company's financial sustainability and enable opportunities for organic and inorganic growth, creating value and profitability as an integrated company for our shareholders. To increase our reserves and production, we have designed a strategy based on four aspects. More exploration activities both onshore and offshore. 
the development of the enhanced recovery program and drilling of more wells close to production hubs, exploration opportunities in terms of unconventional deposits and asset purchases and acquisitions. Our value promise to our shareholders is to achieve production levels between 745,000 to 800,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day by 2022. Our experience in the implementation of primary and secondary recovery technologies, world-class talent and good practices of corporate governance. In 2019, we earned the highest profits of the past six years, driven by a successful and recognized transformation process. Our proven hydrocarbon research in 2019 totaled 1,893 billion barrels of oil equivalent and their average life rose from 7.2 to 7.8 years. For each barrel produced, we're adding 1.69, the highest replacement rate in the past nine years. We have contributed to regional economic growth through the hiring of local goods, services and labor. We help drive the national economy. Just in the last decade, we have transferred to the National Treasury more than 220 trillion pesos in taxes, royalties and dividends. In a changing, demanding and very complex environment, we must innovate, transform ourselves from a digital standpoint and make the most of our knowledge and abilities to ensure the future of the business group and its contribution to the country. We are prepared to continue growing, remain committed to operational excellence, ethics and transparency, and ensuring that safety continues being a pillar of our operations, caring for our workers, protecting the environment, and sharing prosperity with the communities in which we operate. The group employs over 13,000 direct workers, with 35,000 more in contracting firms. We are proud of the transformation we have witnessed and of our conviction that we have the talent to continue being Colombia's flagship company, the greatest source of energy for our economic growth and the well-being of the close to 50 million Colombians who inhabit our country, Ecopetrol. Now, I would like to invite our CEO, Felipe Bayon, to present the 2020-2022 business plan. After his presentation, we will open a Q&A session. Mr. Bayon. Morning. Can you guys hear me well? Yeah. Well, it's great to be here in New York. It's uh, great to see uh, um, lots of... Uh, Faces that we've seen over the years, thanks for being here. And thanks for the interest in Ecopetrol and following what we're doing. Uh, buenos dias. Don't worry, I'll do this in English. So, you know, so we'll, we'll start. And um, the intention is for us to uh, show some uh, material, share some views on where we are, particularly around the 2020-2022 business plan. But more importantly, I think if we can engage in conversation and have Q&A, that'd be great. First thing, if I um, want to leave you with some messages, this would be it. It's strategy, we are on track, we are delivering. You'll see that we actually delivered one year ahead of schedule in terms of our business plan. And that's why last week we launched the 2020-2022 business plan. Uh, we continue to be disciplined around how we deploy our capital. Very strong Rochi and a, our capital structure, and we can talk about that in more detail. In terms of growth, you've seen that we've reverted the, uh, the trend uh, that uh, we saw after the crisis, you know, in 2015-16, when we had to uh, step on the brakes and tighten the belt. And we're seeing that trend being reverted, and uh, importantly, we're looking at uh, mature basins in Colombia, emerging basins in Colombia, but also, if you remember, when we uh, were here a year ago and two years ago, we're telling you about the intention to go international and to have a broader and bigger presence outside of Colombia, and we are delivering on that as well, and we'll talk to that in a bit. 
And in terms of value creation to society, and you'd uh, probably see that this is something new that we want to put or shed more light on. We want to re-emphasize part of our role. You know, we need to run a business. We run a business that's efficient, that's profitable, but we also have this responsibility in terms of how we actually uh, communicate or how we actually interface with society. So we'll talk about that as well. And that's where I'll start. In terms of the value creation for society, and this is something uh, we haven't talked probably as, as deeply or in detail as we should have. A uh, couple things, uh, we see at least five lenses. This could probably continue to evolve as we move forward. The first two on your left, shareholders, majority shareholder, minority shareholders, eight and a half billion dollars last year that were given back to shareholders. And again, if you step back three years, 2015, when we lost money and there was no dividend distribution, I'm sure most of you remember that very, very well. We've reverted that trend and we'll talk about results in a bit. Social and environmental investment, 400 million bucks. This is something that we want to increase as we move forward. I'll talk to that in a bit. Salaries, our employees. You saw in the video that we have 13,000 direct employees in more than 30 companies that we have in the group. And in that sense, this has to do with salaries, benefits, variable pay, training. And the last one, $3.9 billion in terms of the goods and services and contracts that we actually lay out with uh, communities, contractors. So overall, if you add them up, it's $13.7 billion that we contributed back to the economy. And this is back in terms of not only that we need to do what we, uh, what we normally do very well, but it's also how we do that. In terms of the strategy, you saw the video that hasn't changed. Three pillars, capital discipline, cash protection and cost efficiencies, reserves production growth, and then there's four angles to the reserves production growth. Returns. And we got some feedback from some of you guys the first time we're showing this in dollars. You know, normally we had to show this in trillion pesos, and it could be complicated sometimes. It's even complicated for us sometimes, you know, from billions to trillions, it's in dollars, which um, means that uh, over the years, as we saw the price drop dramatically, you saw or you see in the graph a dramatic uh, reduction in revenues, which is the dark green. And by the way, everything will be available if it's not available already. Lina, yeah, for everybody. It's, it's uh, uh, the EBITDA actually dropped dramatically. It's halved from 14 to 15 as prices halved from 100 bucks to 50, well, 99 to 54. And then you saw what I was talking about, the net income of minus $1.5 billion in 15. And as you see the trend going up, it's uh, some positive net income in 16, increasing all the way to 4 billion. And the net income of last year, I know there's some one-offs and special items in that, uh, but was uh, achieved despite the price being eight bucks lower than the prior year. And we continue to, um, to increase our efficiency rate and how much we're actually improving in that sense. And we'll talk about break-evens in a second. So first time we're showing this in, um, in dollars, uh, revenues around 22 billion and EBITDA close to 10 billion. Very, a, a set of very solid results for the company. Fulfilling the promises. So we came last year and the year before, and we talked about the 2019-2021 business plan. We set some guidance on some targets. And if you look at this, and there's more lines, or there could be more lines on this slide, but if you look at things like financial and operational, if you look at things like uh, Rochi, which we signal would be uh, above 11%, it was 14.3%. Let me just go back for a second. Rochi in 2015, 1.9%. Rochi in 16, 2.7%. Important context. So in terms of Rochi, we're at 14.3%. 
in terms of gross debt to EBITDA, where uh, we said we want to be below one and a half, we're at 1.2, and you see the other numbers, EBITDA net income and uh, dividend payment as well. Operational uh, uh, metrics, reserves replacement ratio, 169%. Step back a couple of years, in 15 and 16, we replaced zero reserves. 17, 126%, 18, 129%, and last year, 169%. So the trend in terms of increasing our R2P, which is one of the biggest concerns the market have had, it's actually quite good. So we've moved swiftly from less than six to almost eight years in terms of reserves. And when we think about sustainability long term, that's a key metric. Exploration wells, we wanted to drill 12, we drilled 20 with a 40% success rate, very good. And this year, in terms of 2020, we're actually drilling some bigger wells, deeper wells as well especially in the foothills in Colombia. Production, we had signaled the 720, 730 range, 725, that's where we ended up. Throughput, this is refinery throughput, record year, 374,000 barrels a day. Transported volumes in line with what we had said, and transformation savings. We had targeted $700 million, we achieved a billion dollars. So. Again, as we achieved things a year earlier than we, than we had envisaged, we're coming back and we're laying out or we're presenting the 2020-2022 plan. Financial delivery, I won't go through all of these. You have them in terms of EBITDA margins, EBITDA per barrels, gross debt, I've talked about it. Dividend distribution, you see how it's changed over the years. Net income and break even. Net income break even, sorry, very important especially as we, and, and we've been talking over the last couple of days about everything that's going on in the world. Uncertainty, you know, and over the weekend, people were saying, are prices gonna drop below 50? Are they going to break the technical barrier? I think it's 49.93 or something, whatever the number is. And we saw them rebound. But still, uncertainty and volatility is out there, you know? Do we know where this is going to end up? We don't. We're taking lots of measure in terms of our own operations, our people. And as important, we're ready should we need to pull the levers, and we are already pulling some of them. The good news, we were very well trained and came out very strong from the crisis, and we're ready to act if we need to. And the reason I was pointing to the net income break-even if you, if you had in the graph 2014, the number would be $63 per barrel. So 2014, we needed $63 per barrel Brent. Last year, 29.90. People ask me, have you guys done anything about efficiencies in the company? Have you guys transformed the company? That's a very good demonstration that again, the 13,000 people that work in the company plus the contractors, 35,000 have done that. And Rochi, again, you see that has increased. Uh, operations and some ESG highlights, and again, we're talking a lot more about ESG, back in the context of the role that we have as a company. So exploration, I've talked about the 20 wells, production downstream, midstream. ESG, sulfur content. And we've chosen one, uh, one product, which is our diesel. So for, for reference, the, um, the regulation establishes that the, uh, sulfur content in diesel uh, should be um, no more than 50 parts per million. Uh, why is this critical? Air quality, health, most cities, you know, not unlike Santiago and Mexico and some other cities in the, in the Far East. So Bogota, Medellin have some similar issues. So what we did, we've uh, dramatically reduced the, the level of sulfur in our diesels to 10 parts per million. And this is actually B2, which has 2% of biodiesel. You saw in the video that we have a company called Ecodiesel. 
we can actually put up to 10% of biodiesel in the fuels. That 10 will drop 9.5 or 9 point something. So that's, that's very good news, very good news. Emissions, last year, 1.6 million tons were reduced. Good news, we had 1 million certified by a third party, and we can use the proceeds from that certification to pay our carbon taxes, or part of our carbon taxes. So it's good in terms of our footprint, it's good in terms of the value it generates. Renewable energy, a couple of years ago, we didn't have any. This is our own internal generation, power generation, for, uh, for our own operations. So a couple of years back, we started with uh, biomass from sugar cane bagasse. It's uh, 43 megawatts. Last year, you saw in the video the uh, solar farm or the solar park with 21 megawatts. That uh, solar uh, farm it will reduce 150,000 tons of CO2 in 15 years. On average, everyone in the world is responsible for five tons of CO2 per year. If you live in places like the US, that gets higher. Air conditioning, heating, our footprint gets higher. So what are we doing with the, the um, installation or the use of renewable energies? We're reducing footprint, and the other good thing of this park that we um, started operations with last year in October is that we're saving money. That park itself can give us at least $1 million of cost savings that hit the lifting cost directly. And that's very good news, because people say, saying or ask us, are you guys greenwashing? You know? And I say, well, we're reducing emissions, and we're saving money. Makes sense. And I'll tell you a, a, a little bit of a story here. We installed that park in seven months. It was very quick. 29% of the workforce were women. And in talking to them, they would say, for them, some of them, first time they had ever worked. And most of them would say, now that we are working and not our husbands or companions, we know where the money is going. Big, big difference, again, in terms of the role that we play as a company. Water re reutilization. So we produce this year between 750, 750,000, 760,000 barrels of oil equivalent per day. We produce north of 13 million barrels of water every day. We produce 20 times more water than we produce oil. So in terms of the circular economy and basically reusing the water, it's fundamental. Footprint, cost, impact. And we're very good at doing that in terms of managing water. There's a field, uh, Rubiales, which is probably the largest field. You know, they compete with Castilla that you saw in the video. 120, 125,000 barrels. Rubiales, the vice president, she's a woman as well that runs that operation. And for every 100 barrels of oil that we produce, 98 barrels are water. Two barrels are crude. Just in terms of getting the context of why reusing the water is fundamental. So we can't see the map very well, but bear with me. Imagine there is a map of Colombia here. And those two things are offshore Colombia. And I think the important message is that uh, first, uh, through Hokol, which is 100% owned by the group, we purchased the interest from Chevron in Chuchupa Ballena. These have been fields that have been producing for 40 years. Two big things, we see additional potential in the area. You saw that last year, we were awarded a couple of exploration blocks offshore. So we have uh, access now, full access, and ownership of the facilities. More importantly, it's going to be our first offshore operation in the group. So as you see, as we move forward, mid to long term, it's strategic that we make that step. And the second one is the agreement with Shell. And this is the, um, we've talked about this before, prior years, but 
We had discoveries between 2015 and 17. It was uh, Kronos, it was Gorgon, and Purple Angel. So Shell, we announced this earlier in the year, has farmed in 50% of those ultra-deep water uh, discoveries between 1,500 and 2,500 meters of water. We will drill a well, they will carry us on the well, and we will DST the well, drill stem test the well. We will dynamically know how much the well can produce, which is fundamental as we think of what's the sort of development we need to, uh, to actually do in terms of number of wells, facilities. Our views, and these are Ecopetrol numbers, if you think about Colombia gas reserves, Colombia roughly has 10 years of gas reserves. Uh, um, it's uh, 3.8, see, TCF, roughly 3.8. Uh, official numbers for last year are not, are not public yet. Our view is that, and this is Ecopetrol numbers, as I was saying, in this area, there's north of three TCF. So this area in itself can provide another 10 years of gas for the country. Today, 33 million Colombians use gas. There's one and a half million families that still use wood and coal to cook. And there's 500,000 families that don't have access to energy. So when we think strategically, is this relevant? And as the economy and the population continue to grow, those two things are fundamental. And then uh, here on the, uh, on the right, again, bear with me. Uh, on, the, on the bottom part, right part, Brazil, uh, we had announced the exploration leases of Pau Brazil and Saturno. By the way, we're working on spotting that Saturno well soon. We entered last year into Gato do Mato, which is a uh, discovery that was made by uh, Shell. We purchased 30%. We have in line or line of sight to 90 million barrels of contingent resources that we can put into our books when we uh, sanction and 20 to 30,000 barrels of production in 2025. If you move north to the Gulf of Mexico, we farmed in to a prospect called ESOX from Chevron, uh, and Hess was, was uh, uh, the operator there. We, in less than 12 months, farmed in, drilled, discovered. It's going to be put online very quickly. This notion of time to market, how quickly can we do things? And the third thing, which is the JV in the Permian with Oxy. It's called Rodeo. I was telling somebody yesterday, the good news is the same word in Spanish and, it's, and in English, you know? So we don't need translation there. It's, not a, it's unlike the trillions and billions. It's easier. And I'll tell you a bit more about where we are in that JV. But just think that it was um, a year ago, in February of last year, that we sat down with Oxy to review opportunities. It was July 31st when we announced the deal. September 7th, when we started turning right, with a bit, we started drilling. November, when we closed the deal, we had said December, we closed earlier, and we ended up the year with production. And I'll give you some views on where we're gonna end up the year. If you think about, again, step back two years in time, the map would have been a bit lonelier, you know? In two years, in less than two years, 15 months, We've managed to uh, put ourselves and put the iguana in different parts of the map. It's great in terms of EBITDA, so 200 million barrels in the next couple of years, and over a billion, sorry, 200 million dollars, and over a billion dollars uh, when we see 23, 27 time frame. And if you think about Ecopetrol, around 2026, 20, 27, we could be a company with, with 150,000 barrels of production outside of Colombia. Currently, we have 20,000. Very big step. Reserves. You saw the announcement on reserves. 408 million barrels. Couple things. R2P, 7.8 years. 
You see the inorganic uh, contribution from the Permian, 164 million barrels. But the important message is that enhanced recovery extensions and projects, everybody contributed. Organically, we replaced more than 100% without the impact of price. This is something we had signaled to the market. We want to replace on a yearly basis 100% of our reserves without the benefit or the impact. We're normalizing for that, which is good. But in addition to that, we brought 164 million barrels. So this is, very, this is very good news, very, very good news. Business plan. So this is the focus of the conversation today. I just wanted to uh, put some context. So a few things. If you see the gray uh, lines or the gray text, the small text, it's for reference the numbers that we had in the prior business plan. So you can, you can make the, uh, the comparison. So in terms of financials, we had signaled 12 to 15 billion capex. We're moving to 13 to 17. Everything here is done at $57 per barrel rent. Cash flow, we had signaled 22 billion at 65 dollars. Now we're saying 21 to 22 at 57 dollars. Big change in terms of our cash flow generation. Other way of thinking about this, $7 billion of cash, operating cash being generated per year over the next three years on average. Rochi over 11%, gross debt to EBITDA one to one and a half times. Operationally, we had set 720 to 770 in terms of production. We're increasing that all the way to 800,000 barrels. Transported volume in line with what we've said. Refining throughput, important. We are increasing our refining capacity. We, um, we actually sanctioned a project to connect the original uh, crude tower from the re Refineria de Cartagena, Cartagena refinery, uh, that will give us the ability by the end of next year to have 50,000 barrels of additional capacity in Cartagena. Remember, Colombia grew at 3.3% last year. That brings with it uh, the, the demand for more uh, products, diesel and gasoline. And reserve replacement ratio, north of 100%. ESG, 1.8 to 2 million tons of CO2 reduced in the next three years. Conversations we've had over the last uh, week or so, is this target fully fixed? and I'll be quite open, it's something that we're working. We've described it as a moving target because we think we can do more. And that's what we're pushing for. Last year, it was 1.6 reduction. We want to do more in, in this space. For context, uh, we have emissions to the tune of 11.4 million tons per year, which is roughly 4% of Colombians' emissions. Renewables. 300 megawatts, uh, you saw that a couple of years ago in 16, we had no uh, power generation coming from renewables. Again, this is for our own consumption. Uh, we've said that by 2022, we'll have 300 megawatts of capacity, installed capacity. So last year, 5% of our installed capacity to generate power was renewable. 2022, 20% of our installed capacity will be renewables. Social, environmental investment, up to $500 million. This is over and above what we need to do by law, what we're obliged to do. And uh, main things we'll be working on, water. We want to reach 1 million Colombians with water. There's 1,100 municipalities in Colombia, north of 200 are at risk of not having good water supplies. We want to reach 250,000 kids in terms of education. And we want to work around entrepreneurship with farmers. We want to work around some infrastructure projects, and we can talk to that in more detail. And the total recordable injury frequency of less than 0.6, if you step back a couple of years, this number was north of 1.1. Safety is very important in terms of how we do things, especially, but not only, 
especially as we're ramping up activity. Upstream, few messages, and I, I won't spend too much time. I, I want to move quickly so we can go into Q&As. Production's growing. Everybody's contributing. Primary, secondary, tertiary, subsidiaries, exploration. And here, behind Rodrigo, 45% of our production in 2022 will be incremental production. Those are the messages for the upstream. In terms of potential, you know, and this is hydrocarbons initially in place. If you look at the series from 07 to 19, the tank has grown from 34 billion barrels to 57 billion barrels. And that's why the recovery factors stay flat. Because every time we're finding that we have more resources in country, which is very good news. Because people say, why isn't your recovery factor 30 or 40? The good news is on the right. We have over and above our three peer reserves of 2.8 billion barrels. We have line of sight to 3.4 billion barrels of potential that are sort of separated into different things. Water injection, which we're very good at. In situ combustion, we have been running for six months a pilot on in situ combustion. And we're seeing some very good response from the reservoirs. And we're, we're very enthused by this because the potential of that could be very, very large. Chemical, enhanced oil recovery, primary, just drilling more wells, steam injection. We, um, last year or the year before, we sanctioned a very large project on continuous steam injection. So we're going to be doing more on that, gas injection and cyclic steam simulation. Having said all of that, clearly, we need to ensure that wherever we're moving across our uh, capital discipline process, it makes all the thresholds, you know, and that clearly there's value being generated by every single opportunity that we're moving forward. Good news, we have line of sight of this 3.4 billion barrels. Piedemonte, on Saturday, so a couple days ago, I spend uh, most of my day in Casanare, which is one of the departments in Colombia. And we were receiving the operation of a field called Floreña. Technically, it's Floreña and Pauto. Uh, first time I went to those fields, there was no field, a couple wells. It was in 1995. I had the opportunity to go back and sat with the community and with the governor and the mayor and some, uh, some other uh, people from the community. It's producing now 56,000 barrels. And the good news about this is that now we operate the whole trend of Piedemonte, which is Cusiana, Cupiagua, Floreña. And we think there's lots of synergies. It's 50% of the gas supply for a country. And us being the operator, for example, and having ownership of 100% of those fields, we can send gas from one field to the next field and then produce it in the next field and start doing lots of things in terms of reservoir management, optimization, cost, synergies, you name it. North of $700 million will be invested in the next three years. And you see some of the potentials. We could have 90 million barrels of oil, half a TCF. This is very important. And you see that there is some production associated with that. So very good news. Very good news, as we see in the energy transition, that we ourselves need to become a gasier company. And we'll, we'll talk about where we see ourselves in 2030. Unconventionals in Colombia. So we've been talking about this for at least 10 years as a country. Um, last year, the government commissioned a study, La Comisión de Expertos, the Experts Commission. And uh, that group of people, 13 people, both uh, national and foreign experts, technical experts, people that had done unconventional development, uh, social and environmental experts as well, they recommended to government that the way to do this was something called Proyectos Piloto de Investigación Integral. So this would be holistic research pilot projects. I'm a bit liberal with the translation, but that's roughly what it means. And that means that we will do 
some very specific activities in some parts of the country. Here you see the Middle Magdalena area. For those that are, so this is east of Medellin. It's close to uh, Bucaramanga. It's probably 100 miles by 40, 50 miles across. Um, and the good news is the um, regulation for that will be issued shortly by government, and that means very shortly. Once that regulation is issued, and it's a presidential decree, there's uh, the Ministry of uh, Mines, the Ministry of Health, Ministry of the Environment, a and the regulator, will issue the specific terms of reference in terms of uh, how the pilots need to be developed. What does that mean in terms of the schedule? We see ourselves either by the end of this year or early next year starting activity. We're committed to do the pilots. Uh, we were talking about the Permian earlier, and I'll, I'll give you a, a slight view of where we are right now and where we see ourselves in 2020. But one of the biggest things we see from the Permian is that we can bring some experience that we're gaining uh, acquiring in the Permian, and, and we're deepening our expertise, we can bring some of that back home. So we see ourselves doing this between the end of 2020 and 21, and you see there's some uh, signs, there should be an arrow under the circles, but the anchor play, probably half a billion barrels, all of the horizons, all of the benches, if you will, uh, one billion north of a billion barrels, the middle Magdalena, four to seven billion barrels, and the country right now, and this is a, an initial assessment, between seven to 12 billion barrels. Colombia has two billion barrels of reserves. Let's assume that we are on the lower end of the range, and we're not very good at what we're doing, and we only get six billion barrels. Instead of having six years of reserves, we'll have 24. For the country, this is transformational. In gas, you see there's 100 TCF of gas. Today we have four, which is 10 years of reserves. Again, let's assume we don't reach the 100. Let's assume we reach eight or 12. So instead of 10 years of gas, we'll have 30 or 40 or more years of gas. Transformational. And this is what, why we're fighting for, for the unconventionals. And people say it's complicated, you know? The, uh, when people mention the infamous F word, that would be fracking, it's complicated. It's a very emotional subject. And people, you know, when I walk on the street, they say, oh, there goes the fracking guy, you know? And people stop me, even in the family, and said, we're against fracking. I said, I respect that, that's very good. Why is that? Oh, because I read it's bad. Okay, can you tell me what fracking is? So part of what we need to do as a company and as a country is educate people and ensure that we can address the concerns and apprehensions and issues that people have. It's micro seismicity, water management, noise, effluence, emissions, Inflation, security, prostitution, the list goes on. What we've said, we will be operating inside the fishbowl, operar dentro de una pecera, fishbowl. Everybody can look inside and say, we see what they're doing. Communities, governments, NGOs, academia, the unions. And we've also said, this is not about doing the unconventionals quickly. It's about doing it well, or doing it the right way. So lots of potential in terms of unconventionals. We can talk about that in more detail. Permian, 164 million barrels last year, two rigs, 13 wells down, four online by the end of a year, $750 million of purchase price. Fast forward to 2020, seven to 9,000 barrels net Ecopetrol average for the year. So in less than a year, we'll have 9,000 barrels of production in the Permian. Four rigs, 90 wells down, 50 of them tied into the uh, production, 
700 million of capex. We already have two people, two colleagues from Ecopetrol working in the field. 25 more by the end of May, 19 of them employees of Ecopetrol. And out of those 19, 69% have had extensive international experience with unconventionals. So they'll go to the Permian, deepen the expertise, and bring that back home. Again, there should be a map here of Colombia under the blobs. Bear with me for a second. It means that we'll be operating offshore, onshore. In most basins, we're looking for some 500 to 700 million barrels of resources. People say, oh, you'll only drill 30 wells. At least 30 wells. That's how we think about it. Production, and this is important. Last year, exploration gave us a million barrels of production. May sound small, but the mindset is the key thing. We drill an exploration well, if it's a good well, we put it on production, we tie it back, and we can get the revenues whilst we're getting the uh, information. Um, and production 2021 and 2022, we see ourselves 13 to 15,000 barrels and all the way to almost 20,000 barrels in 2022. We'll be doing some more seismic activity. And in terms of the international activity, we've talked about Brazil, we've talked about the US, and we're also going to be spotting a well in Mexico. Way we think about Mexico, we're committed, we have two licenses, we are not overexposed. And that's a well where we're partners with Petronas from Malaysia. Midstream, two messages. Tariffs have been set last year in dollars for four years. Second message, product lines have a lot of potential in terms of growth. Oil pipelines may stay sort of flat. What we need to do is ensure that we um, find more oil, transport the oil, but in terms of the, uh, the product lines, we see there's lots of opportunity. And again, as the country is growing, we need to be able to support that. Downstream, a couple things. We'll be investing up to $2 billion in the downstream. Every year, we do between 15 and 20 maintenance in the refineries, some of them large. Last, last year, it was a cracking unit in uh, Cartagena, and it was the HDT unit in Barranca. Massive, massive maintenance. Uh, our margins, we see them between 10 and 15. With everything going on over the last weeks, four to six weeks, margins have deteriorated dramatically. The good thing is they're not where we expected them to be for the year, but they are still higher than last year margins, especially in products. But it's something that we need to watch. You know, especially Asia is sort of decelerating a bit, demand dropping, that's taking the margins a bit down. You guys know this better than we do. In terms of our products, in t that's in terms of our products, or products. In terms of crude, uh, last year we sold on average 48% of our volumes to Asia, 53% of our crudes in the 4Q to Asia. The good news, our crudes are considered part of the base load in most refineries in China, which is good news. We've talked over the years that we've uh, become a reliable, predictable source of crudes, unlike some of our neighbors in the region. Uh, fuels quality, very important. In terms of diesel and in terms of gasoline, uh, we're actually ahead of the curve in terms of uh, regulation. You see the green line, it's regulation. The orange or reddish line is what we've done. So 10 parts per million sulfur in terms of diesel, and we'll reach 50 parts per million in terms of gasoline. You've heard about this. Uh, and this is the um, expansion we'll be doing in Cartagena. So the original crude unit will be tied back to uh, Reficar, 140 to $150 million of capex. This will take the refinery from 150,000 barrels to 200,000 barrels. 
Financials. This is CapEx. This is all organic CapEx. So if we do M&A, people were asking, so can you tell us what you will be doing in M&A and with whom and when? We won't be disclosing that. <laughs> I get asked that all the time. But again, if you, if you, if you rewind 12 months, we came and said, we'll be doing some things. And over the course of a year, we announced those things that we were doing. So this is all organic CapEx. So it's 10 to 13 billion in Colombia, 3 to 4 billion outside. So internationally, will be almost a quarter, 25, 23%, 12% offshore. And you see the distribution between the segments. Cash flow, $7 billion of operating cash flow generated every year. This is all the way here. If you take that out, this would be the 2021 business plan that we had shared with you. This is what we see, and this is the update right now. So we will be generating additional cash flow from the activity we've done, from the purchases that we've done. And this is all at 57. So good news in terms of our ability to generate cash flow. Rochi, I've mentioned the 14.3, and will be over 11%. Debt profile. So our debt is roughly $10.5 billion, roughly. And I think the good news, even though there's some maturities or some payments that we need to do over the next uh, three to four years, this is beyond the 2022. The good news, there's a lot of room for us to do things and organize things and accommodate things. We have flexibility. We have lots of lines of credit already approved by the Ministerio de Hacienda, the finance ministry, issuing bonds should we need them. So we're ready. I think it's great that we, the, tool, the toolbox has all the tools we need. We have a very strong balance sheet. We have the ability to generate lots of cash and we can, we can very quickly uh, move should we need to. And again, I'll, I'll just try to finish quickly so we can have a conversation. Business transformation, $3.6 billion to date. We've poured 1.75, 1 1.8 billion in the next four years. We see an additional 1.3 billion already in sight. Cost efficiencies, this is fundamental. How do we keep our cost flat and reducing? And bear in mind or just think that as we produce more volumes, we produce more water. We need more energy. Fundamental that we deal with that. So lifting costs, refining costs, transportation costs, all of them fundamental. Digital strategy. We're doing lots of things. Last year, we invested $51 million. We already saw $10 million in savings only last year. For example, our refiners in Cartagena, in the 34 plants that we have, they see volumes or throughput, pressure, temperature. Now they see real-time online dollars. They know for every single unit in Cartagena if we're making money or not. Brilliant. That was done in four months. Now we're implementing that in Barranca. Just to give you one example, there's lots of things there. We can talk about that as well. We're going to be investing uh, overall $126 million between the two years, and we see $180 million of economic value. Commercial value chain, you've heard me before. Some years ago, we would wait for people to come and buy our crudes in Bogota very comfortably, comfort zone, people sitting there. Now we need to go and sell our crudes. Big difference. And having done that, or having made that change strategically has paid off as we are in the middle of this crisis that we're in because of the long-term relationships we have directly with refiners, especially in China. EBITDA will continue to grow. There's more other things we can talk about that as well in detail. Gas, fundamental. We want to be 35% of our production. We want that to be gas in 2030. Uh, there's actually lots of opportunity. I was telling you about uh, Piedemonte, the, uh, the trend where we have now 100% ownership, uh, we see ourselves actually uh, having lots of levers and lots of opportunity. The new gas or the new guys vice presidency that was announced a co couple weeks back, 
it's also run like a, by a woman. 20 years of experience, petroleum engineering. ESG initiatives, decarbonization, you see how much we've reduced in terms of emissions. We've talked about renewables. Wanna uh, um, highlight a few things. We're reducing gas flaring from 45 million scuffs a day a couple years back to 9 million scuffs by the end of this year. Somebody was asking me recently, is that a good business, you know? And I said, well, the gas that I was flaring, I can put it back into the system and sell it, or I can use it to generate power, and I reduce my footprint. It makes lots of sense. In addition to that, uh, we will increase energy efficiency, routing, zero routing flaring by 2030, and 20% reduction uh, by 2030 of uh, CO2 emissions. Nature-based solutions, very important. Colombia, every year, has a deforestation of roughly 260,000 soccer pitches. Lots of area. We have the opportunity as a country, and we have the opportunity as a company, to change some of those trends. Trees go very, grow very quickly in Colombia. We have plenty of sun, plenty of water, and we have lots of land as a company. For example, one of the things we're, we're looking at is, can we use some of the water that we are producing, treat the water, irrigate trees, grow trees, generate power, use the power in my own operations, and have full circular, circular sorry, economy solution for that. Cheaper energy, lower emissions. Diversity and inclusion, couple things. Uh, two years ago, only in 38% of the processes for choosing leaders for specific areas, we had at least one women candidate. Today, that number is 72. Continues. It needs to continue to grow. 7.6% of our employees have some sort of disability. So how do we actually train our people to be cognizant, to be aware of those disabilities, and help the people with disabilities to fully, uh, I mean, uh, fulfill their, or put out their potential, fully potential. Victims of internal conflict and veterans, 3.1%, minorities, 4%, and six ongoing initiatives on sexual orientation. This has been going on for only the last 12 months with this rigor. Each area is actually chaired or run by a first-line vice president in the company. And it's created lots of new space for people in terms of just bringing all of them into the conversation and all of them into the, uh, the office. Board, uh, sorry, governance. If you look at corporate governance, a few things that I want to highlight, you'll have the material. You know we have a board. We've had a board for the last year or so. 2008, we had four independent board members. Today, we have eight out of nine. We're very, very uh, sort of thoughtful and disciplined around protecting the rights of minority shareholders. You see some of the things that we've done. Board oversight. We've recently created an HSC, Health, <laughs> Safety, and Environmental Committee at the board level. We've also created a Technology and Innovation Committee at the board level. Big step change in terms of board oversight. We can talk more to that. And with this one, I'll finish. Road ahead. 2030, we want to be 35% gas, 65% liquids. We want to move from being an onshore company to a company that has roughly 50% in the onshore, and the rest is a combination of offshore and unconventionals. And geography, we want to move to a company that's 20% outside of country. And I was telling you about the potential production numbers for that period. And how do we want to do that? optimize our portfolio. So existing fields, we want to accelerate development. We want to move towards gas assets, development, those assets, short cycle and low, low cost projects, sorry. The thing that's not there, we will need to offload between 50 and $75 million of assets as well every year. So divestment, we've been very good at buying things, bringing things into the portfolio. We'll need to divest some things 
on the tail. Climate change, we've talked about decarbonization, cleaner fuels, we've talked about renewable energy, and we will continue to evaluate new business opportunities, always taking into account of, with the backdrop of the energy transition. With that, we'll close the presentation and we'll go into Q&A. Again, thanks for being here, and we're ready to take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. I will now open the Q&A session. Please raise your hand if you wish to ask a question, and we will pass on the microphone. We will work on a maximum of two questions per person as we seek most participation from the, floor, from the room. Please ask your questions. Please say your name and the company which you represent. Uh, thank you, Felipe, Jaime, and team. Christian Audi with Santander. Uh, congratulations on achieving the results for 2019, and thank you for the uh, increased transparency. Uh, I wanted to ask three, but I'll focus on two questions. The first one on production. Can you explain, uh, you mentioned the target of 745 to 800 for 2022. What explains this range? Uh, what are the assumptions that lead to this range? Uh, and second, on return on capital employed, you've done a phenomenal job increasing your Rossi uh, from 13 to 14, but then you go back to seeking uh, above 11% going forward. Um, is that because of the drop in oil prices? And could you also provide us maybe some color on the breakdown of this raw sea between upstream, downstream, and midstream? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So in terms of production, what uh, I think there's a few things that I'd like to highlight. The first one, it, we have a 15% natural decline rate in our fields on average. There's some fields that actually decline 25, 30%. So there are lots of things that we need to do to ensure that we bring more volumes into the mix. And it's a combination of, as you saw, some of the fields that are being reverted. Uh, in the case of this year, we have Piedemonte, we have the gas fields from Chuchupa Ballena, we have some M&A activity or inorganic activity from Pyridure that's coming into the uh, organic side of the business. And I think the range that uh, it, it just shows how we want to see ourselves moving through time. We've set this year 750 to 760 in terms of production. We see that going all the way to 800,000 barrels. And what we've done is actually increase or raise the bar a bit from where we were last year. But lots of things in terms of what we need to do. And again, part of that is investment we're doing, primary, the EOR, and there may be some M&A activities as well. I don't know, Rodrigo, if you want to add something. Yes, if you see the next three years production curve is based on the recovery in EOR projects. This is important that we receive a Piedemonte last week and will help us to grow in the production for next year. But the three years, again, uh, three years ahead, are based on water flooding, especially in the heavy oil that we have in Chichimene and Castilla, and also in the middle Magdalena Valley. But that's the strategy that we have been doing, but not for now, for the last three years. Yeah, with regards to, to Roshi, um, Christian, a couple of things. First is um, the, the, the guidance that we're providing over the next three years uh, ab about being above 11%. Uh, it's not necessarily that we see a deterioration of Roshi from the 14% that we achieved last year. We're just simply adjusting for the change in the price scenario, moving from 65 to 57. So uh, the, that, that reduction that you see is solely on the basis of changing price assumption. Uh, when you look at the underlying uh, performance, both in terms of EBITDA generation and capital intensity, actually, we are actually increasing the underlying Roshi that, that, that we see. Um, hopefully, we, we, we will end up being around you know, 12, 13 percent, uh, but we feel more comfortable sticking to the guidance of being above 11, 
which is the one that we have been providing for the last uh, couple of years. With regards to a specific segment um, Roche levels, uh, what I can tell you directionally is that uh, both the upstream and the midstream are in, in very healthy uh, double-digit numbers. They're above 15%, both of those segments. Uh, downstream, however, um, is, is in single units. Uh, they're moving, you know, from a plant standpoint, we expect to be moving from around 4% Roche levels that we have in the downstream to around 8% Roche levels. Um, the reason why the Roche in the downstream is, is, is uh, significantly lower than the one that we see in the other segments is, is a result of primarily the price environment in which we're in right now, which is, which is giving us uh, margins and, uh, that are relatively low and we are not uh, forecasting uh, ambitious margins over the next three years. Um, so that, that's one end. And the other component is that from a capital standpoint, of course, uh, there is a significant capital historically allocated to the downstream segment. So those are the two components. Having said that, the EBITDA generation of the downstream in the plant period is, is healthy. We're talking about, a, about 800 to a billion dollars of EBITDA coming from that segment. Hi, Cameron Ross with Mangrove Partners. Uh, as it relates to the downstream business, could you talk a little bit about the uh, expansion work being done at Reficar and what sort of the time frame for completing that and how that relates to improving the, uh, the Rochi margins? So um, in terms of timing, we've uh, recently sanctioned the project. I was mentioning it's between 140 and $150 million. Uh, the units, the original units of the uh, refinery had been preserved. So what we need to do is uh, uh, this year and probably until the end of 3Q mm -hmm. next year, we'll be doing a lot of the construction work and just ensuring that from a uh, instrumentation, you know, utilities, the control loops of the refinery, everything's set up. And we should be starting up uh, at the end, back end of next year, some 50,000 uh, barrels. And I think there will be some flexibility in terms of uh, products and stuff. Uh, I think more importantly, uh, we will in Cartagena have two crude units, which is very good news. So we have additional flexibility in terms of uh, future major uh, maintenance and whenever we need to do turnarounds and stuff. And uh, remember that Cartagena is very well placed in terms of its geography, uh, in terms of the um, uh, conversion factors. There technically will be a reduction in conversion factors with this unit being put into play. Uh, but I think overall we, we feel very comfortable with Cartagena that has been seeing the benefits of IMO recently. We, we see that for the next three few years actually panning out and working well. So uh, uh, we view that as uh, value accretive. You know, it's good in terms of uh, uh, basically going hand in hand with uh, the increase in demand that we're seeing in country. You know, remember that uh, at least for now, we're uh, self-sufficient in diesel as a country. We're not self-sufficient in gasoline. We need to import some of the gasoline. So we see there we have an opportunity to basically uh, go into that space and, and try to balance things out a bit going forward. Felipe, if I, if I may, might add. Um, so we're very conscious uh, around the, you know, the volatility of the margins in the downstream segment. This particular project, when we sanctioned it, um, we, we saw two or three very specific strengths around the project that makes us feel very comfortable that, that is its value accretive. The first thing is um, we're actually looking uh, when, in, in using a very prudent uh, expected margins for diesel associated to diesel differentials in particular, you're looking at a project that has a payback of two years uh, when you are keeping current differentials in your plan assumption, which is very conservative because we're actually, the, the current differentials that we're seeing in diesel are uh, 
on the very conservative side for any forecast that you see right now. And it's, it's, an, it's an effect of the uncertainty around Marpol. It's an effect associated actually to the current uh, uh, prognosis around China and the like. So this project works on current margins. Uh, with Marpol, the regulation coming in, our view is that in 2021 and 2022, we should be expecting five, six uh, uh, dollars per barrel additional uh, in, in, with regards to diesel. And that makes this project uh, good for all seasons, basically. Good morning, Andres Cardona from City. I have two questions. The first one is about uh, the farming you sign with Shell. If I just want to confirm if there is any incremental carry. You mentioned there was one well to be drilled, but just want to understand if there is any incremental carry and if you can elaborate about it. Uh, about this uh, asset, when do you expect is a reasonable time to see the first gas production? And if you could put it in context on the 35% target of production gas by 2030, is the offshore a relevant contributor to, to that target? And the second question is about M&A. Uh, you mentioned we are facing today high volatility. And I just want to understand how relevant could be the M&A going forward. And if the 1.5 uh, gross debt to EBITDA uh, limit is the, the, what will drive the limit of M&A or if you can go above this level for a very short period of time? Thank you. Thanks, Andres. And uh, I'll take the first one. I'll ask Jaime to talk about the second one. And Jorge will tell us a bit more about the details on the carry, which is your specific question. So, and as, as, I, as I was saying earlier, I think the good news is that uh, we have uh, a partner like Shell, which is, uh, not only, I mean, top tier and world class in terms of ultra deep water developments, but it's also uh, well renowned for uh, gas development and marketing. So that's very good news. We're, we're very excited with the partnership. And you saw also, Andres, that uh, we not only partner with them for this offshore, we're partnering with them in Brazil as well. So there's, there's a stronger, bigger relationship, if you will, as we see it, and we're very happy with that. I was mentioning that we see at least uh, some three TCF of potential here. Uh, we need to get ready to, uh, to drill the first appraisal well, and we will get carried on that, on the first well, and we will DST the well as well. So I, I think that's good news in terms of having dynamic data from, from the well. And I think based on, on the results from that well, we'll narrow in the um, development concept in terms of number of wells, kind of uh, production or the type of production facility that will be required. But again, both uh, companies are very enthused in terms of uh, the opportunity this poses. And clearly, uh, it will be very relevant as we move forward uh, in terms of uh, having additional gas molecules coming through the market. So if you think about the 2027, 2028 timeframe, how do we see ourselves? Uh, good news again, I think, uh, Having somebody like Shell uh, as, as part of the, uh, the consortia and being the operator and them bringing all the development experience, we could definitely see some, um, some uh, acceleration in some of the activities that will benefit in terms of seeing those molecules into the market much quicker. Jorge. Hello. Hello. Sí. Me, me. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, only to, to extend uh, a little bit uh, the answer from Felipe. Uh, you know, the program that we have established uh, with Shell at this moment, as uh, Felipe mentioned, is one well and uh, one DST, and we're going to be carried by this. After that, after the evaluation of this, what we're going to do is just to complete the, all the appraisal program. Remember, this is a huge area. It's a frontier area. But this data, the DST data, the, the, the data from production, is going to be a relevant information in order to uh, understand how much production can we get from a, from a well. And in that way, you know, understand how many 
where are we gonna need to develop the, the, the field. So, so this is a technical work that has to be done after the, uh, the drilling of the first wells. We are looking also at some exploration wells around it, like uh, you know, oil prospects in the, in the area. Uh, you remember that the, uh, last year, Ecopetrol acquired also 2,000 square kilometers of uh, to the seismic in the next, in the adjacent area in order to complete the information of the area. So all of this information is gonna be used, uh, you know, in order to understand the hydrocarbon system, how much uh, production we're gonna get for per well, and uh, our plans that uh, we have is that probably the first production is gonna be 2027, 20, 2028, 20, you know, so in the, that range. Uh, as uh, Felipe mentioned, uh, you know, all of this production uh, originally is uh, seen as a, uh, you know, the, the provider of the gas uh, in Colombia. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at, uh, at uh, uh, this opportunity as well. So we have the contracts, we have uh, the, the need of the gas, and, uh, and I think uh, together we share, we, uh, 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 having a company of first class in uh, gas commercialization and, and the water operation is, is a, a big uh, hit or, or big uh, game for us. Hello, Andres. Uh, with regards to kind of how we're thinking about M&A, um, there, there's three angles to this. Uh, it is an integral part of the strategy like Felipe uh, presented. Um, we, we look at three lenses. One is the quality of the opportunities, as in they need to be value accretive. We're not shopping for reserves. We're actually shopping for value. Secondly, um, they need to be uh, consistent with the focus areas that we've signaled. Uh, both kind of geographically and types of play. And then from a financial frame, um, I would, I would uh, give visibility to two things. Firstly is when you look at our cash generation, we're looking at around 3.5 to $4 billion per annum of available cash that can be either distributed to shareholders or used for um, these purposes. If you think about the dividend policy, which is of you know between 40 and 60 percent, there's going to be an extra two billion dollars per annum that can be utilized for quality opportunities if if the merits are there. Uh, secondly, when you think about uh, our um, gearing ratio and and you think about uh, uh, the the capital structure of the company, this one to 1.5 uh, times a bit the debt to EBITDA ratio that we've signaled actually provides us between 2.5 and 3.5 billion dollars of additional uh, capacity uh, if these opportunities arise. Uh, lastly, what I would say is that uh, when you look at, it, at this from 100,000 feet, our, our current indebtedness is on the low side compared to peers. Uh, and, and I mean to, to kind of the industry leaders in, in that regard. So we could, uh, if the merits were there and if there was a strong value proposition, we would feel comfortable on a, on a specific and punctual basis to go even up to two times EBITDA for a short period of time if that was necessary to fund a quality transaction. Of course, this is dynamic. We consider things like market environment. Uh, you know, Felipe spoke uh, in, in a lot of detail before about uh, the current environment that we're having in oil and gas and the volatility and the uncertainties. All those things are considered, but uh, we believe that the flexibility that we have to fund uh, M&A opportunities that are consistent with strategies is, is actually quite robust. <clears throat> Christian again, Felipe and Jaime, could you talk a little bit, I know this is a diff challenging topic, coronavirus, but wh when you do your internal analysis, where is the company exposed uh, and is there anything that you can do about it on a micro basis? I'm not talking about macro because you can't control oil prices, but you can't control, for example, your exposure in exports, uh, which 
if I remember correctly, around half of your exports go to China. So what, uh, where do you see the company most exposed and what steps are you taking to try to address it as much as you can? Thanks. So, so definitely, and I think there's different levels at which we uh, think about it. So in terms of uh, exposure of our own people, uh, I'm sure you heard that uh, the, uh, the meeting, uh, the gathering of Sarah Week that was going to happen next uh, week has been canceled. Uh, and it's probably the, the premier energy week in the year. And it's been now pushed into 2021. And one, having conversations with the organizers over the weekend, uh, a lot of that had to do with we cannot afford as an industry to have three or 4,000 people that are very relevant to the energy supply in the world being quarantined for a long time, you know, and just having, not, not having them available. So when you take that from that level to ourselves in Ecopetrol, some of the things we're doing over the weekend and yesterday was uh, in terms of uh, restrictions to travel, uh, people working from home, people coming, even not only from, from uh, work-related uh, travel or business travel, but from uh, holidays, you know, this is a time where people are coming back. So at that level, very specific to have the protocols in place, very clear communication with our people. We've uh, suspended for the time being travel to Europe and Asia. So very, very quickly taking care of our own staff. And I think that's, that's important. And that's one level of exposure. The second thing is uh, in terms of our goods and products. So uh, the good thing, we have some flexibility in terms of how we can load the refineries. It's not unlimited. We can take more domestic crudes as related to international or foreign crudes or imported crudes, but that's limited. But again, we have uh, very good, strong relationships with uh, the uh, refineries in China, and they're taking us crude, our crudes are part of their base load. Again, I think the key point here is where is this going to end up and how are things evolving? We don't know. And that's why we need to be ready. I was mentioning that uh, we're already pulling some levers in terms of things that we could uh, displace in times, in terms of uh, some investments, some things, again, uh, just having a deeper focus around efficiencies and costs and, and, and limiting some of the things that we need to do. And, and why is that important? Because I, I, don't, I haven't checked the price right now. What's the price? 50? Is it about 50, 52, probably 53? It ended up ye yesterday a bit higher. But what happens if the price drops to the mid-40s, you know, and then the mid-30s? And, and I think that's sort of uh, where we see else ourselves, and that would be an additional level of exposure, if you will. So there's different lenses that we can put into this. Having said that, uh, I was mentioning the, the break-evens that we've achieved over the last few years. So we're comfortable. We, we, we did our plan at $57. Uh, we sanctioned our projects at 55. We um, test everything at 50. So we're very comfortable in terms of how robust our investments are, how resilient they are. But I think the key thing here is, again, uncertainty. Is this going to, to expand dramatically? And is the impact I, I think I was chatting with somebody yesterday. There's some direct implications of everything that's happening around the world, but I think a panic comes to mind, you know, in terms of market, in terms of the people, in terms of reactions. So we need to be mindful, be very thoughtful in terms of uh, directing our own staff, in terms of what we do, uh, how we deal with it, and there's different levels in terms of reactions. Um, and from a finance standpoint, you know, and going to the micro level, uh, three specific things uh, that we're doing right now, and again, this is just about being, you know, ahead of the curve. Uh, firstly, we are looking at our unitary costs in detail, right, kind of line by line, uh, with a view to identify optimizations uh, around 5% that we believe that that can give us a caution a, 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 to the impacts that this could have in terms of overall margins. Secondly, from a 
a financing standpoint, uh, as you know, we have contingent lines open, right, and available to the company should we require them. We have a, around a billion dollars in contingent lines that we can utilize at any moment in time. And this is, again, if, you, if, we, if uh, a catastrophic scenario occurred uh, with regards to coronavirus, that's the second component. And thirdly, from a capital discipline standpoint, what I would add to what Felipe mentioned is that when you look at the $5.6 billion of CapEx that we have for this year, we actually have that uh, on a tiered basis where we know exactly which projects we can actually defer or, or, or tweak with a view to gain an optimization. So um, I would say that we have headroom to sustain last year's level of CapEx if we need it without growing this year if we were under that type of scenario. Good morning. Thank you very much for the presentation. Anne Milney from Bank of America. So you've really just recently begun on your international expansion, but you're already in the Gulf of Mexico, Brazil, Permian Basin. Uh, you alluded a little bit to the relationship with Shell. What I'd like to know is what lessons have you learned so far? Are there any regions that you seem more predisposed to than others? Uh, and maybe what you, know, what you think you might be developing or going forward in the future? Yeah, so I'll start and then I'll, I'll ask uh, Juan Manuel Rojas, our new business uh, vice president. So a uh, few things. One, we've um, some years ago decided that we wanted to stay in the Americas. We wanted focus because the, the company had at some stage had, had some uh, activity in, uh, in Africa, for example, in West Africa. We've pulled back from that. And I think that uh, we've been in an international player for more than a decade. So we have been in uh, Brazil, but mostly in the Foz de Amazon, Portiguar, Ceará, in that area. Uh, we have been in Peru for over a decade, and we have been in the Gulf of Mexico. I, I think the key thing right now is uh, focus. We've said we want to be in the US. A year ago, we said we want to stay in the Gulf of Mexico, and we want to do unconventionals. We've, we've, we're doing both of them, and we're trying to grow our Gulf of Mexico business, and we're doing the, uh, the JV with Oxy. We wanted to be in the pre-salt in Brazil. We have two exploration licenses, and we have now Gato do Mato as well. We wanted to be in Mexico, so we've basically done what we said we wanted to do, and I think there's opportunity for us to deepen in some of those uh, areas. Uh, I think it's, there's an opportunity for us to strengthen some of the relationships. You see there's uh, strong links with uh, Oxy, there's some strong links with Shell, strong links with Chevron, we have very close ties with Petronas as well. So those relationships we value, uh, we see them as relationships of lots of respect. We, we see with uh, all of those partners eye to eye, which is great. And I think we're considered as a company that brings lots of value to the table as well in terms of our experience and how we do things. And the good thing is that most of the times we have uh, more opportunities and more invitations even from outside the company to look at things that we can, um, that we can deal with ultimately. You know, we, we want to stay focused, you know, and that's, I think, discipline and, and being very orderly about what you do is very important. Juan Manuel, anything you want to add, please? Yeah, Felipe, probably um, I will add that um, we, we think very deeply when we start thinking of uh, associating with companies, uh, developing partnerships. And as Felipe was mentioning, we have strengthened significantly the relationship with companies that we deem are best or world-class in what they do. So when we thought about uh, entering into the Permian, we first thought who will be the perfect company that we should partner with. And we came to the conclusion of Oxy. We had a 40 year relationship with them in Colombia, but besides that, they are probably the best operators in the Permian. So that made a lot of sense. When we started thinking of going to the pre-salt or more mature basin in Brazil, we first asked ourselves, 
who is the largest private operator in the pre-sale? And what advantages could it bring to our relationship? And then we came up with Shell. And that's why we decided to go with them in the Saturno block initially and afterwards in Gato do Mato. When we thought of our, our Colombian Caribbean uh, situation, we thought of Shell too because they do not, they do not only have the capability in gas, they are, they are leaders worldwide in gas, but also in the development of these kinds of projects. So a partnership strengthening, and especially targeted with this, this kind of companies is something we think about a lot uh, and share similar visions in the long run uh, uh, in these cases. Um, and uh, where should we focus ahead? Well, we were mentioning uh, Brazil, uh, US onshore and um, US GUM internationally. In Brazil, we will take a close look to what's coming next in the future rounds of the pre-salt. Uh, last year, there was a suspended round in the Sesión Onerosa, uh, and I think the market spoke by itself. So we have been very capital disciplined in terms of when we approach these opportunities, and we were in line. We said, it's, we don't feel comfortable going into Sesión Onerosa now under these conditions. We will wait until they are right. Um, in the U.S. GUM, we like the Miocene. We have 62 blocks in the U.S. GUM, of which most of them have a presence in the Miocene play and close to infrastructure. And so it, it allows for a fast development. The case of ESOX is, is what, what we did. It's, it's, a, it's a good case. So those are the kinds of things that we take a close look to. And in the U.S. onshore, of course, we already have a foot in the Permian and we will be expectations on, on, on what opportunities could arise there. I leave it. Thanks. Thanks for the presentation. This is Bruno Montanari with Morgan Stanley. Two questions. Uh, if we think about the challenges for both uh, the 2022 and longer term 2030 uh, uh, targets and aspirations, uh, aside from the commodity risk, which would, would you say are the, the key challenges to, to overcome? Yes, and secondly, if we thinking about Rosie specifically for upstream, uh, can you give us a hint of how the more complex EOR uh, initiatives such as chemical simulation or steam injection compare vis-a-vis uh, -vis the primary recovery project you have? Thank you very much. Okay, so I'll take the first one, and I'll ask Rodrigo to uh, take us through the second one in terms of uh, how those uh, rank and relate to some of the primary developments. So in terms of uh, 2022 and 2030, um, and you think about the risk, you know, what are the things that are out there that could hit us? And we're just chatting earlier about something that probably came from uh, left field that we didn't see coming that was uh, a coronavirus, you know, uh, in the world. And very, very quickly we need to react. So the point is that there will be some things one-offs, you know, that very quickly come to hit you, that you need to be uh, ready in terms of having a very strong uh, foothold, you know, you need to be standing well to react. I think the good news from that point of view is that Ecopetrol has demonstrated that we're very good at uh, reacting and very good at dealing with crisis. So I think that's good. Second thing, and this is my own personal reflection, but uh, when people ask me about 2019, I um, I described 2019 as the year in which there was a massive increase in the speed of change. In terms of expectations, you know, people see us as uh, an industry that's uh, not necessarily the most benign or it's not the most uh, respected industry as such. Uh, and we need to deal with that, you know, as, as we think that uh, from seven and a half billion people in the world, there's going to be one and a half or two billion more in the next 15, 20 years. Uh, how do we provide energy to those people? How do we deal with the energy transition in a way that's responsible, uh, that actually makes sense? Uh, we we're having these conversations in Davos a couple months back, and it's uh, fossil fuels are fundamental for the energy transition, first thing. Regardless, you know, people say, oh, we need to grow renewables much faster. Yes, but there, still be, there will be 15, 20, 25% of the energy mix 
in 2040 or 50, uh, unless some disruptive technology or something comes through. So I think that's part of the equation. The other thing which is quite relevant, I think, uh, is this notion that we don't necessarily need to get rid or eliminate fossil fuels. What we need to do is get rid and eliminate and reduce the emissions that come from the use of fossil fuels. That's a massive paradigm shift. And when you ask me, if you ask me, so what's some of the bigger threats or risks out there to 2030, I think it's that. How can we, uh, instead of being uh, your finger pointed, if you will, by society, millennials, people that have expectations, how can we work with them to ensure that we, we do whatever is required? And all of this in the mix of, is it gonna be one and a half degrees or it's gonna be two degrees, it's gonna be six degrees. And in addition to that, it's not only what we can do to ensure that climate change is not irreversible, you know, and, and we do what we need to do, all of us, you know. This is not a problem for governments and companies. This is a broader problem, and that's part of the issue. But also, how do we get ready with our own facilities, you know? What are the, if the levels in the oceans rose by a meter or two meters or three meters or the rivers? We need to be ready in terms of operations as well. So that's, because we know how to deal with uncertainty. We've done uh, the dealing with price reductions, commodities, swings, you know, in, in, in margins and stuff. We, we can do that. We're very, very good at doing that. But I think overall, we must not lose sight of how do we need to do uh, uh, do all of this transition. The good news, and with this I'll close and I'll hand it over to Rodrigo, is uh, for the first time in Davos this year, uh, I didn't feel the it's your fault conversation. It was more like we're all together in this. How do we actually fix this? Which is quite encouraging. You know that there's a change in tone. And again, I'm sharing my own personal reflection, but I think that's how we, we view ourselves in 2025, 30, 35, and uh, again, that's, that's sort of my view of some of the things we'll need to address. Rodrigo. Thanks, Felipe. Hello, Bruno. This is a very good question. If you see our long-term portfolio, Felipe was mentioned that we have 3.4 billion barrel beyond the 3P reserve, and it's divided in different kind of technology. Of course, there are a lot of challenges there, but more than one or a big portion of those resources are economical at the moment. We have to still work in, and that's why it's so important, the recovery program that we have in the company, because we start with a pilot, understand the behavior in the subsurface, and then we start to work in all the optimization that we can introduce in the massive expansion that we plan in order to become economical. Believe me, that is part of my responsibility and it's in my performance review, year performance review, try to achieve better development to mm -hmm. become economical. Challenges is the energy, and we, uh, Felipe has been spoke about that, and we are working very hard in energy, how we are going to manage the energy. The other thing is important is the management of water, we are trying to improve their development in terms of reducing the water production and boost the oil production. But we are working very hard on that. If you see the technologies and the portfolio is risk balance, just because most of the, uh, the volumes are related with water flooding, it's a mature technology, and also we have a huge uh, investment in terms of facilities that we are going to take advantage in the future to develop the water flooding projects. And also, for example, chemical UR is another technology that we can take advantage of the existing facilities. So we are working very hard on that. But also, the message here is a big portion of the resources are economical right now. We're still working and become more and more volumes economical for the long term. Thank you for the time. Uh, Eduardo Arango from Goldman Sachs. Uh, I would like to know what percentage of your cost is denominated in Colombian pesos, and given the recently depreciation of the Colombian peso to historical 
minimums or the weakest point? Do you have any policy towards hedging costs or how, how do you see that? Thank you. Hi, Eduardo. Um, so our split is about um, 57, 43, 57 being in pesos percent. Uh, it moves around kind of that frame of 55 to 65 over the years. Um, that, of course, a, a, you know, the incidence of that is when you have high devaluation, it helps the cost structure of the company more than it hinders. Um, with regards to hedging currency risk, um, um, basically we have a natural hedge around it. So we very rarely do we want to use financial instruments to actually offset that. Uh, we only do that in specific operations where we see that because of time differences, you are gonna have a very clear exposure to that. Uh, they are very limited and far in between in the group. Uh, so generally speaking, we leave ourselves exposed to, to, to those fluctuations. Andres Cardona from City again. Uh, just two questions. The first one is if you can share your view about quality discount evolution over the next couple of months or short term in term. And the second one uh, has to do with the cost efficiency opportunities. Uh, at one of the slides you show us there is a target for lifting costs around $7.6 per barrel. Uh, how fast can you get to that level and what are the main opportunities that will drive that efficiency? And if you maybe can share the drivers for uh, incremental cost efficiency opportunities, that would be very helpful. So um, let me start with, with lifting cost. So um, as, as, you, as you noted, um, the, the business plan is taking us to a place where we actually want to, so last year we managed to stabilize lifting costs. We were having an upward trend we stabilize that. Our goal in the plan is to start seeing um, reductions in, in unit lifting costs over the next three years. Uh, we believe uh, that there's a broad range around that. Uh, you know, right? we, we signal that there's kind of a band of a dollar in which we can move, where the lower end of that band is around $7.5 uh, per barrel. The sort of initiatives that, we're, that we are focusing on are around the three key drivers of lifting costs. Uh, the first one is energy intensity, right? Uh, energy makes up about 30% of the, of the equation. Uh, things that we're doing in that regard they are looking at the energy matrix where we're incorporating renewable, you know, cheaper renewable sources. We're also looking at substituting some of the energy sources, others that we have in more efficient ways. And whenever we're looking at sanctioning projects, we're now looking at projects from an energy intensity angle as one of the criteria for sanction. So that's giving laser-like focus to, to the energy conversation. The second component is around water management. Uh, as a whole, water management uh, has, in addition to the environmental aspects uh, that, that, it, that it, it carries with it, it also has a significant cost component. We have a number of strategies around optimizing a, a water management, and we're looking at it in a very integrated way. The third component is around a, a operating and maintenance, you know, general operating and maintenance. We're looking at contracting. We're looking at the structure in which that's done. We're looking at a regional optimization where we see that, you know, given the nature of the assets, you can actually find economies of scale. We're looking also at technology in terms of pumps uh, and equipment. We're looking at digitalization of operations and maintenance. So a whole suite of, of initiatives that we think can make a, that, that we see line of sight to this progress. Um, so that's around lifting costs. With regards to differentials uh, in the short term, there is a lot of uncertainty. Right? There is a lot of uncertainty. Uh, directionally, what we see, directionally, uh, we feel, we feel uh, 
comfortable with a recovery of crude, right? Uh, we think this is a very uh, episodic uh, uh, occurrence, what's occurring right now. Uh, we believe that when you look at all the fundamentals, once this uh, uh, news uh, develops, we are going to go back to, to um, kind of our plan scenarios is not better. And, and as Felipe mentioned, you know, we're looking at 57 Brent with a differential that will evolve over the course of the next three years from a diff of around $6 per barrel for our, for our crude basket to up to a 11 or 12 discounts. And this is in a Marpol scenario where, where, where we could see a Castilla heavily impacted. With regards to products, a, there is there is a positive lens and then there is there is a negative lens. The positive lens is that in any scenario that we see, we actually see differentials over the next three years being better than the differentials that we had in 2019, right? Uh, last year. So basically, from a diffs angle, we see upside to the business. Uh, the question is whether whether the current events are gonna uh, dampen that a bit. And we believe that in the near term, that's certainly gonna be the case. We believe that the next six months are gonna be bearish uh, for diesel, uh, for gasoline, for fuel oil, and for NAFTA. Yeah, we, we, we strongly believe that, but we see a recovery after that. Okay, thank you so much. We have reached the end of our Q&A session and would like to thank you all for your interest in EcoPatrol. Uh, on the screen, you will find the QR business cards of EcoPatrol Senior Management. Thank you so much for coming and have a great day.